Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, very happy to see you all here. Uh, I'm doing a very quick introduction because I think we all know who Yuri Tivian is. He doesn't need much introduction. Uh, the quickest introduction I can do is that uh, he's the co-author of a very recently translated book uh, into Estonian called Dialogue with the Screen. Uh, and Yuri co-authored this book together with another Yuri, Yuri Lotman. Uh, that's it for introduction. Uh, we want to leave more time for questions and uh, also more time for Yuri to speak. And if it happens that we have time left in the end, I will introduce him a bit longer. No need. Uh, so thank you, Ellen. Uh, actually, I bring a little surprise for you personally here. The, before I came here, I went through a stack of Lotman's notes and letters and in my drawer and stumbled upon one note that mentions you. <laughs> uh, uh, it is a purely factual piece of information, uh, but at the end of it, as always with Lotman, uh, is a cute little, a cute little joke. Early in 1987, a Russian language magazine uh, in Riga printed an interview uh, with Lotman and even offered a honorarium for it to Lotman. Uh, to be able to pay it, they needed Lotman's uh, passport details, passport number, uh, number of dependents, and uh, the usual stuff. So, uh, here is the note, uh, and, if, and here is the text. Uh, my passport details, Lot Yuri, passport number, date of birth, three children, a multitude of grandchildren. Uh, and if I understand, uh, you, Ellen, Ellen, were actually already part of it this multitude. Uh, now, uh, yes, I've been fortunate to know Lotman, and yes, to collaborate with him, but this does not mean I knew him very well. Lotman used to live here, of course, me in Riga. I was never a Tartu student. I was not even one of Lotman's sons. And what I regret the most, I'm not one of Lotman's lovely granddaughters. Um, so, and yes, it was precisely because I had less occasions to converse with Lotman that I would have liked to. Uh, his conversations live in my memory. And some may, by now, have a, acquired a life of their own. Uh, some because they changed the way thing. Some because they were so much Lotman. Uh, his signature mix of wit and wisdom. Some others because they sounded puzzlingly un Lotman. Uh, for aside from being Lotman, Lotman was also uh, a normal human being uh, and uh, never uh, strained to live up to his name or his mustache. Uh, and in his uh, idiom, it is Slujit uh, Lotmanum pri usach. As Paris Igorov, Lotman's friends, a biographer, once noted, Lotman was too passionate a person to be always consistent. Yet, to think of it, Lotman's inconsistencies were fully consistent uh, with uh, one of Lotman's central discoveries about culture, that to count as a fact of culture, a text, a sign, or an act of behavior must belong to two different languages at once. And Lotman, as we recall, whether on a page, on stage, or in everyday life, uh, was himself a walking part of culture, fact of culture, and in the semi-sphere of memory, uh, still is. Um, when it came to relationship between history and, fic and fiction, Lotman could be either magnanimously agnostic or pedantically protective of history and its little facts. He used to be mildly ambivalent about Tinyanov's historical prose and ferociously ambivalent about Eisenstein and his treatment of history, especially in Ivan the Treble. 
A quick example from 1982, the year in which the first Tinyanov conference took place in Tinyanov's native town in Latvia. Lotman was there, and I was there too, with a silent film of 1927, uh, whose screenplay had been co-written by Tinyanov and Julian Oxman, a major historian and philologist. Now, uh, the film was a period melodrama, an enjoyable movie written and shot to outshine America's popular cinema by its own standards. A handsome, noble-hearted hero, one, an eye-watering love story, and a perfectly villainous villain, a man you love to hate. The action takes place in the south of Russia in the middle of the Decemberist uprising with recognizable prototypes shining through characters, ranks, and names. But given the kind of movie the filmmakers wanted to produce, you can imagine how faithful the result was to the historical past. After the screening, Lotman came up to me impressed, but not outraged. The picture is amazing. Картина изумляет. We know Oxman as a prime expert on the history of Decembrism in southern Russia. We also know him for being a person who'd rather die than lie. Or take Tinyanov, Lotman continues, uh, with his thorough knowledge of 19th century minds and life. How come they did not protest against turning the history of Decembrism into a piece of cinematic mythology? And not even bothered to remove their names from the film's credits. How come? Any idea why? I had none. Lotman had. Because, he said, for a historian, facts of the past are not locked in the past. What history is depends on the language and medium we use to access it. A finale, Lotman came up with to conclude an, artis an article he and I co-wrote about that Decembrist movie sounded nothing short of the relativity theory for history. This Lotman wrote to conclude our article on that film. Film language can serve the historian as a passageway into the past. History is complex, but it is also simple and even primitive. On the one hand, as if masterminded by genius, it requires an intricate literary fabric to come alive. On the other, uh, it injects itself in primitive molds and manifests itself through the molds of mass consciousness. Uh, the Tinyanov that documents history. I continue the quotation. The Tinyanov that documents history, the Tinyanov that recreates history using the intricate fabric of literary narr narratives, and the Tinyanov that explores history by way of translating it into the language of the primitive is the same person. This person is Oedipus facing the Sphinx of history. That was Lotman uh, at the height of his battles. Uh, as Ellen Lotman reminded us today, uh, the article I just quoted was not only, sorry, um, mm, was not was not my only experience uh, of working with Yuri Lotman. Uh, he and I also co-wrote uh, the book on cinema Ellen has uh, just translated into Estonian. Uh, Lotman and I began discussing the future book sometime in the late 1980s. And it was inevitable that sooner or later, sooner rather than later, we would wind up discussing Sergei Eisenstein and my favorite among Eisenstein's film, Ivan the Terrible. And the moment it happened, it was I who found myself facing a sphinx, a sphinx of a historian. Only recently did I happen to learn that I was not the only Oedipus, 
be puzzled by Lotman's passionate dislike for Eisenstein as a filmmaker, as a theorist, and of course, vicariously as a person. Oedipus number one had been more than a decade before me, Lotman's graduate student, Irina Bielabrovtseva, who was a much better Rex than I, because each time Bielabrovtseva ran into the Lotman versus Eisenstein enigma, she took contemporaneous notes, which she published among, along with Lotman's letters to her on the subject. Uh, I call it enigma because what transpires from these notes and letters and also from Lotman's conversations with me on this subject sounds surprisingly un-Lotman. Lotman, who extols Tinyanov, the screenwriter, for taking liberties with historical sources, says that Eisenstein's screenplay, Ivan the Terrible, is impossible to read because it takes up and repeats what that idiot Pavel Sumarokov had written in 1800 uh, about a complicity between Novgorod and Poland. Uh, and Lotman's critical language when he says that all Eisenstein cared for were beautiful shots, красивые кадры, uh, polyphony, uh, and artistic devices, приемы, uh, which staying, while staying indifferent to what his film is calling for, uh, uh, let us face it, this language does not sound structuralist or Lotman-like at all. Um, or what he says in a letter to Belovrovtseva, that Eisenstein had two souls, one satanic, the other mechanical, and used uh, the latter soul to exercise the former. Now, uh, this sounds more like something from Merishkovsky than something uh, that Lotman would likely to have written. So how did it happen that Lotman's patience for Eisenstein was so low? Uh, one reason for this, as Belabrovtsev plausibly suggests, could have been Lotman's took all too seriously Eisenstein's mischievous memories uh, and exercise, an exercise in a Freudian self-analysis, uh, written partly, uh, as Belbrovtso suspects, to provide Eisenstein's future biographers with childhood clues to his artistic genius. I agree. Uh, another suggestion worth pursuing, and uh, I'm going to uh, show later in this talk, uh, comes uh, from the pen of Mikhail Trunin, while Lotman, as Trunin shows, uh, knew Eisenstein published writings first had, he read some of uh, published volumes, uh, his idea of Eisenstein's theory may have been pre-shaped by the way it emerges, reduced, rationalized, disambiguated, from Zhalkovsky Shchiglov's writings on generative poetics. He did publish some, but he also openly said he disliked that in which Eisenstein, Zhalkovsky Shiglov, is declared a progenitor of structuralism. Uh, in this view, Lotman's hate of Eisenstein was a byproduct of Zhalkovsky's cult of Eisenstein. Sounds convincing. I, for one, have also a strong suspicion that Lotman's, uh, that, uh, that suspicion that Lotman's hate of Eisenstein had been indoctrinated by Solzhenitsyn. Remember, Lotman recalls in his non-memoirs how back in 1963, Solzhenitsyn suddenly materialized in Tartu, and the two of them talked non-stop for two days, uh, most likely about one day of Ivan Denisovich that came out one year before. If you recall, a bed in which Ivan Denisovich Shukhov spends nights while serving time in the labor camp is located between two other beds. One occupied by a devoted Christian named, of course, Alyosha, uh, with whom Shukhov conducts conversations about God. The other belonging to a young filmmaker from Moscow, uh, arrested, as Shukhov knows, in his uh, middle 
uh, in the middle, oh, sorry, in the middle of making his first film. Now, uh, this would-be filmmaker name, named Cesar, Cesar, Caesar, uh, is better off in the labor camp than many other inmates. His Moscow family sends Caesar cigarettes and salami twice a month, twice a month, which he uses to bribe his way into a clerical job instead of hard labor, and also uh, uses a puff of, the of tobacco or a slice of salami uh, to, this or, uh, to, to this or that chore uh, on the part of Ivan Denisovich Shulkov, bringing him a pot of soup to the bureau or standing in line for him for packages. Now, uh, Solzhenitsyn's Caesar is a generic alien in Narodets. Caesar, I quote, uh, is a mixture of all nations. He may be Greek, may be Jewish, may be a gypsy, go figure. Uh, his name, Caesar, uh, may have been chosen by Solzhenitsyn to signal that Ivan Denisovich lives uh, by the gospel com gospel compromise, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Uh, and like myself, this Caesar is an admirer of Eisenstein. We learned this when, at one point of Solzhenitsyn's book, Shukhov overhears a passionate debate between Caesar, Caesar, and an inmate numbered H123, apropos Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible. Um, as while preparing for this talk, I reread Ivan Denisovich. I had a moment of deja vu how much Solzhenitsyn's fictional uh, debate reminded my own attempts to convince uh, Yuri Mikhailovich into Eisenstein's faith and how closely uh, his objections matched the ones voiced by the inmate number 123, H123. Uh, I'll enact, I'll dub uh, um, our conversation with Solzhenitsyn's, with quotes from Solzhenitsyn's uh, novel, um, uh, tale, long story. Uh, this is me. Um, to be objective, uh, you must admit that Eisenstein is a genius. Ivan the Terrible isn't uh, the word, uh, is it the work of a genius? Uh, the Prichniki dance, uh, the cathedral scene, the mask. Uh, all this is effect, affectation. All this is affectation, krivlenia. Uh, so much art that there is no longer room for art. All pepper and poppy instead of the daily bread. And the low, uh, the, this lowly political idea to justify autocratic uh, political tyranny. A mockery of three generations of Russian intelligentsia uh, and me. But listen, art is not about what? Art is about how. Who cares about how? Uh, why, if it does not awaken good feelings in me? Uh, quotation from Pushkin. Uh, now, to hell with your how. Oops. Uh, to, to, uh, sorry. To hell with your how. Uh, if it does not, yeah, wake up. Let me say it. Okay. Uh, now, what follows in my talk uh, is a follow-up discussion with Lotman. Uh, this time, without Solzhenitsyn as a prompter, I still believe Lotman misread Eisenstein's poetics, both theoretical and practical. Uh, the, he called it cerebral, determinist, even overdetermined, to use a term coined on Wiki, Wikipedia, Wiki, Wiki Dictionary, Eisenstein, uh, uh, Eisenstein sorry, Lotman 
disambiguated Eisenstein. So uh, the, my plan is to ambiguate him back. Uh, so, th this is, uh, so this is Eisenstein, his sketch of himself sitting uh, at his desk. And this is Lotman. Um, and this is the title of my talk. Do I have time for a sip of water? Yeah. Uh, we know how crucial ambiguity uh, was to Lotman's models of either cultural cultures or artistic texts. He called it different names and different uh, at different times and on different levels of uh, theorizing. Uh, so sometimes it's a tension between two static principles of versifications which results in dynamics. Sometimes it's an intersection of contrasting styles and points of view in a work of prose. Or when Lotman reasons that, unlike cultures of the past, the models that European culture um, tend to combine rather than choose between the alternative principle of, organiza of organization, uh, he calls it synthesis. Probably after Hegel. Now, uh, uh, if a visual illustration of Lotman's idea were needed, I would choose Eisenstein's weird drawing from 1931, uh, called, as you can read in French, synthesis. And, uh, and I have to ch change my notebook. Eisenstein's drawing, made in Mexico in 1931, as I said, it features a bull nailed to a cross. Crucified on the bull and the bull's cross is, in turn, a naked woman with a wound in her torso. There are other details. Uh, we'll examine them shortly. But the key triads are the woman, the bull, and the cross. Eisenstein's caption below lists four names related to uh, three religions. Eve from the Old Testament, uh, Jesus from the New One, Europa from Greek mythology, kidnapped, of course, by a bull, uh, and Torera, uh, the bull's complementary twin from the world of Carida. Uh, it may at first appear that what we are dealing with is a conglomeration, a compendium of symbols coming from different cultures. This, however, is not how Eisenstein's envisaged his synthesis to work. His method, as I will show, is not additive, this and this plus this, uh, but analytical. Uh, he operates by what may be called ambiguation. The rule of the game here is to relate every element of the whole to more or less, to, uh, more, to more than one context, to every detail, every signifying detail, must signify two things at minimum. Uh, number of contexts, Judaic, pagan, Christian, or erotic. And then Eisenstein watches their meaning change accordingly. Uh, let us now inspect this picture top to bottom. Now, driven into the bull's neck are, of course, banderillas, uh, the barb barbaric barb darts used by bullfighters. But because our bull is also Jesus Christ, these are also rays of sanctity, uh, a halo similar to the one 
in this shot from the famous God sequence in Eisenstein's 1928 uh, film, October. And this is his future film of 1945. Uh, and this is the oath of the Oprichniki. Uh, so he takes it, he takes it and he connects it to the film, as I w to, 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 to different films, as I will uh, show a little later. Um, the bull is still alive, you can see, breath coming out of his nostrils, uh, but is mortally wounded. Uh, what is unusual, however, is that the Terrera's sword is sticking out of the bull's mouth. He's killed through the mouth. Uh, which makes the bull slash Jesus Christ also a circus sword swallower. Uh, let's go one floor down uh, to inspect the wounds. One wound uh, found in the bull's side uh, is two things at once. Uh, one which the creator had cut to produce Eve from Adam's rib, rib, and of course, yes, she is just crawling out. Uh, uh, so our bull, in addition to all these things, is also Adam. And also the wound that that Roman soldier had inflicted to kill Jesus on the cross. Uh, now, uh, the swollen, the, sorry, now the smaller wound on Eve's side turns her into a a female equivalent of Adam, Adam, B, a female equivalent of Christ. Uh, now, down to the first floor, uh, we find the dying bull's phallus. Uh, we, we find the phallus, uh, which Eisenstein's pencil made to look like an, like an erect, erect candle, uh, like the ones in the hands of that dead soldier from battleship Patyomkin. This is the close-up of that candle. And like the one, uh, okay, and like the one he would put into the hands of the dying Tsar in Eisenstein, still to be made Ivan the Terrible. This brings us to the final section of this talk, uh, in which I show how ambiguation works in Ivan the Terrible, part two. Pivotal for this film is a scene called Fiery Furnace, named so after a mystery play that used to be staged in 16th century Russian churches yearly before Christmas. The play, and uh, this is the icon, of course, uh, uh, 16th century icons uh, um, depicting uh, the, the, the fiery, uh, fiery furnace story. Uh, uh, the play reenacts the story from the Old Testament. You'll know it, uh, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, in which three Jewish boys find themselves thrown into a burning uh, furnace for refusing to worship a golden idol sanctified by the Babylonian Tsar Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the act of throwing and burning is being fulfilled by the Tsar's henchmen named Chaldeans. Appalled, the God of Israel sends down an angel who extinguishes the fire and saves the boy and burns the Chaldeans. Uh, now, in Eisenstein's film, the fiery furnace play staged in the Moscow Cathedral is part of the Boyer's plot to shame Ivan into abolishing the Oprichnina, much like Hamlet hoped to mousetrap Claudius by making actors reenact Hamlet's father's murder. Uh, here is a fragment uh, that leads up to the execution. Uh, the two Chaldeans are shown dressed into clowns uh, uh, garbs, in clones' costumes, for historically these parts were indeed performed in Russia by itinerant uh, comedians. Yeah.
Охалти! Охалти! Всего не тетил царюва, харова. А я не слушались. Не слушались. А мы вверхнем их весь и начнем их жесть. Okay, um, that's the first part of uh, the show. The Tsar is not uh, witnessing it yet. He will show up later and we will feel it's a trap, a mouse trap. Uh, okay, here uh, uh, um, is a question. Uh, how historical it was? Pretty historical. Pretty historical. We know uh, that Eisenstein read books about fiery furnace, uh, mainly uh, theater, history, theater history books. Uh, used every text he could from the originals by which we know the details about this show. Some details about its settings and some details about the actual spoken text. We know them. Uh, and here comes... Um, okay, here comes one, um, uh, 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 one dialogue from a book, uh, right, uh, of uh, 1890s, um, and its translation uh, into English. Because I perform an English speaker here, I'll read the English version, uh, but uh, uh, do look at the uh, first one. Uh, first, first of the two Chaldeans, Comrade, Tovarish. Uh, what? Are these the Tsar's children? the Tsars, and they would not worship the golden idol? They would not. And we'll throw them into the furnace and we'll start burning them. Uh, again, I'm showing how faithful the dialogue is uh, with a few minor correction. One is quite funny. You will notice it. Это дело царева, харова, а я не слушались, не слушались, а мы вверхнем их весь и начнем их жесть. Uh, so, uh, pretty close. Uh, even Lotman would be pleased. But uh, did you notice what's missing? Товарищ. For obvious reason. Uh, uh, so, on the one hand, the historian and Eisenstein wanted the fiery furnace show to look as authentic, uh, as authentic as he could make it. On the other, as we go through Eisenstein's preparatory uh, notes for Ivan the Terrible, we increasingly realize how much uh, of it we owe to the method he called synthesis, much like he did in the drawings of the bull on the cross. Eisenstein wants every element of the fiery furnace scene uh, mean what it means and some something else, plus something else. Uh, in, in one word, what Eisenstein is after is ambiguity. Thus, one day in April 1942, he was in the process of making, making this film, an idea crosses Eisenstein's mind, which had never occurred to him before. You fool, he calls himself. Why not think of it earlier? Durak. The costumes worn by the Chaldeans must be a parody of their Prichniki costumes. Use the dog's head, tailor, similar, similarly to the Prichniki costumes, etc. This is uh, the bulb the idea. He, he dropped it, as he did 
other ideas often. Uh, but the idea was there to ambiguate it. Eisenstein wants to destabilize our reading of visual science, wanted to flip back and forth between the church, theater, and period politics, and most dangerously, uh, contemporary politics. Eisenstein was particularly interested in the theater of power, the interest that you can feel in a surprising no uh, note uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, I, I will quote later, uh, to the climatic confrontation uh, between the Tsar and his opponent, political opponent, uh, Metropolit Philippe. Uh, we want to see at the fragment. Uh, I start in the middle of the furnace. The Tsar comes in. I, I will not translate uh, uh, the, the dialogue. The important thing is to look at it as a piece of theater. This is a stage. Узнаю царя православного в нецарских одеждах. Не узнаю царя православного в деяниях языческих. Что тебе, чернец, за дело до наших царских деяний? Кровожадного зверя деяний твои! Молчи, Филипп! Не прикослой в державе нашей, не то постигнет тебя Гнев мой. Так новых это носор! Шош Иван ближних своих огнем! Но и к ним не зайдет ангел с мечом и выведет их из темниц. Молчи, Филипп! Покорись в церкви, Иван. Etc. Uh, here the theater of power, as you've seen, uh, wedges into and interferes with uh, theater as such. The histor hist histrionic version of the miracle in Babylon. Uh, Philip on one on the one side and Ivan on the other, claim the stage of this cathedral, this country, and their epoch. Th this claim is laid and depends on uh, the forcefulness of each actant's and actor's entrance onto the stage in the hair. Um, each tries to outglance and outgestures each other. Here is a preparatory note uh, to this scene. Three times does Ivan ask the Philip blessing. Three times does he confront a refusal. Three movements of Philip's head. And the arrows showing three movements of Philip's head. And this is Ivan 
sitting here. Uh, and an interesting note, uh, the third of them comes from the 47 samurai, uh, 37 samurai uh, of uh, uh, the kabuki play I saw in 1928, and he did in Moscow. So suddenly, this, this moment, this glance, this gesture uh, is from Kabuki. No, uh, not just the head tilt. To those who have been to Japan, uh, the whole scene rings decisively Kabuki. This narrow carpet looks like, this narrow carpet looks like Hanamiti, and the way they move on it, for instance, yes, and I'm following time, I will try to uh, end so that you can... But this is theatre. The way they establish, put foot on the ground is, is uh, theatre and is very much kabuki. Uh, now, the third and final case of ambiguation I'd like to present is a co-present within Eisenstein's frame of, man, of mind of the angelic and the dirty. Uh, as we recall, the adventure of Jewish boys in Babylon ends happily. An angel descends, uh, this time that, uh, turns the fire into water and saves the boys from burning. A sketch drawn by Eisenstein uh, exists, which presents him or her as a creature, the same angel, same angel, as a creature of Rublevian beauty. The angel of fiery furnace, a caption reads. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a drawing in which Eisenstein, uh, the, uh, Eisenstein's guardian agent is pre pre uh, presented as a flying phallus. Uh, as a flying phallus, this is angel and this is the same angel a little bit more ambiguous, uh, are creating ambiguity. You can see it. I don't want to touch it with my uh, uh, laser, but you can see it up there. Uh, it's flying. Uh, it's rolling down because Eisenstein actually explains the mechanics of the theatrical, of, th of the, the, the theatrical trick. Uh, it was hanging there in the church, and then they it would descend, and the film doesn't exist, but he wanted to do it. Now, um, the angel of the, uh, okay, uh, this, uh, okay, uh, Alexis, yeah, and of course, uh, the church is presented, um, the angel is flying phallus, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, all right, the rest is kind of visually clear. Uh, now, wearing a Russian headdress, Kakoshnik, on her head, the maiden stands for Russian Orthodox Church. Her vagina, of course, is the fiery furnace in which the boys are burning or being born, ambiguity. Uh, and the savior angel is ready to be pulled down. Blasphemous at, as it may at first appear, Eisenstein's dirty picture reflects pretty, ac pretty accurately the canonical clerical interpretation of the fiery furnace mystery play as understood by 16th century theologists. Uh, the show used to be staged every December before Christmas, that, uh, it before, that is, before the day when Jesus Christ came out of the Holy Mary's womb. And here is, all right, I'm skipping this. Uh, here is uh, a quotation from uh, Konstantin Nikolsky, proto uh, the, the official canon of church and services and chants. He just describes it. Uh, the miraculous salvation of three youngsters from the blazing fire of the furnace pre prefigures the great mystery of Jesus Christ's birth. And I'm simplifying Nikolsky's solemn and convoluted prose, but the meaning is that uh, precisely as the boys in the furnace did not perish, but acquired a renewed life, so the world through the birth of Christ, did not perish, but was renewed. Fine, it's philosophy. But then gynecology starts, the theological gynecology, uh, because why they needed the, uh, all this uh, casuistry. 
Uh, and why the image of the Freie Freudians was so handy was that in their infinite sanctimony, the Orthodox Church, church ideologists needed an excuse to exonerate and sanitize uh, Mary's womb, a source of all sins by definition. Uh, so Maiden Mary did use her womb to give birth to Christ, which was a good thing to do. But a womb is a womb and remains so. So our priest Nikolsky goes on. The furnace, having uh, admitted the boys inside itself, did not inflame itself. So Maiden Mary, having uh, conceived our Savior, did not inflame her womb. Thus, the fire of the furnace, having refused to burn the young children, etc., it's a seedless, 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 bisseminoia, inception, in the birth of Christ. Uh, and so on in the spirit uh, of um, clerical uh, gynecology. And this uh, is also uh, what was sung in Russian uh, churches, the Slavonic, in, uh, in, in church Slavonic, in Russian cathedrals during the fire inferno. The furnace of Babylon did not singe Nyapali, the maiden, neither did the divine fire defile the maiden, Nerasli. Um, am I right? I, I'm, I leave like five minutes because I need a conclusion, which uh, takes us back to Lotman, which everyone uh, is impatient for. Um, so I, uh, 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 I, I will skip uh, Saint. Augustine, and what he said about uh, two wounds, how he, okay, well, I'm not saying what I'm skipping. Uh, uh, I go to my epilogue. It's not a, it's my epilogue. Um, I'm finding, but not, I'm finished, but not yet fully finished. Uh, as an epilogue to this talk, let me use two quotations from Lotman's talk of 8, 1968, uh, yet unpublished, but well preserved at the archive of Lotman Foundation in Tallinn. And if Tatiana is here, if you're listening, I thank you for uh, this archival uh, uh, piece. So, uh, okay, uh, 1968 was the 17th anniversary of Eisenstein's birth, as today is 100th anniversary of Lotman. There was a conference at the Film Institute in Moscow that year, as we are having one here, and Lotman came and gave a talk. Here is the beginning of his talk. Uh, when people say the human kind the humankind, the humanity, needs history. They are telling the truth. But history must be constantly revised. Anniversaries have a strong tendency towards annihilating history. And then the stenographer's remark here, it's, it's a sh shorthand, stenographer wrote all this. Her remark here says, uh, uh, any, any major, uh, uh, commotion in the audience. I don't hear any commotion here because we're actually redoubling the situation which Lotham himself found fault with. So, uh, and then he goes on. In the history of culture anniversaries, in the history of culture, anniversaries play a deeply negative role. Uh, the stenographer says, applause. I don't hear any applause. I don't want my applause. I want actually uh, applause for Lotman. Uh, and uh, realization of the paradox of me and us giving anniversary talks. Uh, therefore, Lotman says, I cannot, I simply cannot shape my talk as an anniversary talk. This would co uh, co contradict my specialty as a scholar. Okay, and this was how Lotman began his talk, and this was how. Uh, uh, he ends, I want to use my final minute to say this. Uh, people debate if legacies can be kept alive. Now, imagine a chicken breaks its egg from within and runs away. A chicken is alive and gone, but we stay studying the eggshell, uh, the egg's legacy. Uh, art's genuine progression 
results from art's struggle against itself, which must not end in a victory, for a victory in art is a suicide of art. Tatiana, if you are here, this is my chicken book. I wrote a book uh, about Ivan the Terrible uh, as part of a dialogue with, mm, uh, with Lotman as a continuation of that. So this is my chicken, and I want uh, it to be in Lotman's uh, library somewhere, or your, per, uh, your personal one. Uh, the final sentence. Uh, uh, in uh, one of his interviews, Lotman said that culture was a space that makes it possible to talk to those uh, no longer living, and that his worst fear was to disappoint Pushkin. I suspect some of you uh, did not expect this talk to take so long, but I do hope that Yuri Lotman is still here. Thank you, Yuri. Are there any questions from the audience right away? Mm -hmm. uh, Yuri, who is uh, Lydia Ivanovna? Oh, uh, uh, she's a costume designer. Um, I just uh, yeah, uh, wanted to win some time. This is, uh, he loved to shock his collaborators, particularly women, with those kinds of pictures. Uh, so she was trying to figure out, uh, Lydia Ivanova, uh, how, to st how to stage it, what it means. And he says, well, the fiery furnace, quite hot. Uh, and then uh, Lydia Ivanovna, uh, uh, now you understand the essence of this the film. The, uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah the, 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 the beauty of this scene. Uh, so... Thank you. Uh, you know, Lotman wouldn't be Lotman if he would speak about Eisenstein always the same. Uh -huh. I'm a witness. Uh, I, have a, I had a talk with Lotman on Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, a young teacher who first watched the film and was absolutely furious about the political conception, about everything. I was absolutely out of myself when I came to, to talk with Lotman. And he listened my, you know, self-furious talk in the talk. But he is a genius. Hmm. He is a genius. Can't you understand? Look, what the, what's the composition of the screen? What is the composition of the shot? You, uh, didn't, uh, did you watch only the first part of the film or the second part of the film? Didn't you understood the ambiguity of the, of the second part? So, you know, the roles changed. Yeah. What he, he told you, you know, uh, um, I was in, in uh, the part of Yuri Lotman when talking with you and and he was in, uh, in the part of your, you when talking with you. Okay. Yeah, because um, plus, in addition to being a genius, he was also a, a, an extremely talented actor. Uh, and uh, he actually uh, loved to object and be objected to. Uh, you, would send, you, you know the tired Lotman, and when you say something unexpected to him and that goes against, you know, he suddenly, his eyes liven up and starts talking. So, yeah, that, that, that part of the thing that actually some ideas were born out of uh, um, the struggle, and he never wanted to win. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I have one question about the uh, synthesis drawing. Uh, there is, it? let me see if yeah. we can. So there is, uh, there is a famous um, fixation that Eisenstein had with triangles. 
and yeah. uh, and this uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is, is a triangle, and it looks like uh, this oh. Eve's hands and eyes form a triangle with eyes in her hands. So the same shape as her eye is in her palms. Mm. Here, maybe yeah, I can uh, show yeah, the course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I skipped that part because we have children as well as but also nuns. I skipped that part, but if you, if you mention it, uh, yes, he had this theory that uh, it's we a vagina. We even have grandchildren here. Uh, that the, the eye um, is also a vagina. And uh, he had the whole sub Mm, sub-routine in, uh, in discussing uh, stigmatics. Uh, this. And yes, it is important also that this thing, I, is in the palm. Because uh, that, he says, is regress from uh, the sense of vision to the sense of touch. So vagina uh, is mainly the sense of touch for him. Uh, it's simply uh, the evolution of the sensorium. He believed in those things that developed into an eye. So there is a difference, of course, uh, but also an internal connection. It's like Pan's labyrinth. Pan's um, labyrinth is one thing, but also, an, oh, I should uh, uh, send you a, a book I wrote on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's Pan's labyrinth, exactly uh, the same thing. Um, do, uh, do we have any questions from the um, from the online audience? We should have, no, no, okay. So, fantastic, perfect, perfect On, timing. Perfect timing. Uh -huh. Thank you all, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.